Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new Ragger Club episode of the James Tea Podcast. We spend the James Spill the Tea, and each week, one of us picks a record to talk about, and then we review it. And this week, it's my recommended record, which is Daft Punk's Random Access Memories, which is funny because I am very unfamiliar with Daft Punk, actually. It's one of my biggest musical blind spots, but because it is the 10th anniversary of this record, a very big record uh, in the previous decade, I figured it would be a perfect opportunity to get to talk about this album, let myself familiarize myself with this record and talk about it with some people who were probably a little bit more knowledgeable and were a bit more in the know with Daft Punk when this album actually came out like Riley. So just to be clear, is this your first Daft Punk album and only Daft Punk album so far? In full, yes. Right. But of course you'll know some of their other songs because how can you know? Oh yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's really oh, interesting. I didn't actually know that. So that that gives uh, whatever you have to say, I think that'll give it a really interesting context regardless. And, you know, one of the great things about our duo for these looking back albums is that often it is the case that one of us is intimately familiar with the record and has been for a really, really long time. The other person's approaching it with fresh ears, which I think is what makes our conversational dynamic really interesting. And um, anyone who, you know, watches us religiously, if there is anyone out there who does, might know that the first time we talked about Daft Punk, well, the first time I talked about Daft Punk this year was in our now episode on bad albums by great artists, where I singled out their 2007 effort Human After All as an example of a an act that had completely by this point nailed their aesthetic and knew everything that they were about and had a fully fledged identity, but completely misfired in the pursuit of one particular artistic exercise with that album and i unpacked that in that segment i'm quite satisfied with it so but i think it's worth mentioning because random access memories the fourth and seemingly final daft punk album uh was the follow-up to human after all was you know and human after all as that record came six years after 2001's incredible discovery Random Access Memories comes six years after Human After All. And from the, before this album was even released, there was the sense of circumstance around it, right? This was one of the big event releases of 2013. This was heavily, highly anticipated, not just because it was Daft Punk's first album in an age, but also because it seemed as though they were coming at this and approaching this with more ambition than they had ever had previously in their entire discography. And, you know, the really interesting thing about Random Access Memories contextually that you might not be able to appreciate Jake, but have being less familiar with their music is that, you know, with their earlier stuff, with records like Homework and Discovery, albums that mean a whole lot to me, albums that I heard very young and completely like for a lot, I'm sure they did for a lot of young people, completely changed your perceptions of what pop music could do in the space of dance music. Those records were very forward looking, like there were elements of, of course, there were always elements of you know, religious respect of the past on those records, like teachers off of homework, for instance, this reverence towards the 70s and 80s. But in the context of which Daft Punk arrived in the late 90s, what they were doing was very cutting edge. The way they were taking those influences, the way they were pushing them into new places and, you know, essentially creating a new context and format for dance music coming off the back of so many different electronic music waves in the two decades prior to their arrival was you know, it was unfathomable. It was it was really ahead of the curve. It was really uh, hugely influential at the time. So what's interesting about Random Access Memories is that Daft Punk, by this point, you know, by the point of discovery, really, had nothing left to prove and didn't really have much of a desire to continue kind of carving forward and innovating and creating this new, pushing forward into this new wave of musical, predicting where electronic music in the future might go. They were no longer interested in that. And I mean, it may be that they never really were and that the success and influence they had with those first two records was more incidental than purposeful. But certainly with random access memories this is an album that is deeply almost religiously reverential of the past and not just past musical sounds which there are so many of them you know this is almost a whirlwind history of pop music condensed into the 70 minute album there's that there's lots of sounds of the 50s 60s 70s 80s i mean giorgio by Moroda offers a kind of meta commentary that essentially allows daft punk to explain the whole concept of what they're doing through the voice of giorgio Moroder. 
So you have that sonically, but also this is a throwback to a particular era of album you know a particular era of event albums of album craft and structure of the idea of an album as this dense huge well-oiled experience essentially that you can kind of fall into and be taken on an actual journey you know you might not necessarily think this as much listening to daft punk songs but they're actually really heavily influenced by progressive rock and particularly the rise of progressive rock in the 70s and they're particularly influenced by the ambition that progressive rock brought to what the album could be as a format right the kinds of journeys an album could take you on and so with random access memories this climactic record and the entire arc of their whole existence they sought to basically hone everything that they adored about the ambition and the forward thinking nature of the album format through the lens of progressive rock and progressive music in the 70s and also tie that aesthetically into a love letter to all the music that they grew up on to all the music that influenced them to all the music that they feel is a fundamental part of the story that leads to where they are today. And so that's one of the things that's so exciting and all encompassing about Random Access Memories. When you put this album on, especially if you listen to it on vinyl, you not immediately, you feel like, okay, I'm being taken on a journey. Like this is something that's been constructed as a, as an experience, right? It's not just, you know, here's another, here's a collection of songs. Here's a collection of jams. Here's a, a, a jam session sort of thing. It's like, okay, this is so ridiculously in love with this classical idea of what an album can be that you it feels almost alien in its context right like in 2013 when this album came out we were kind of on this sort of threshold you know the internet had well and truly taken hold over music culture but it wasn't sort of as saturated in that space as it is today comparatively and so at the time Random Access Memories felt like this kind of like last gasp, look backward and remember what we had in the days where everything was analog, in the days where everything had this additional weight to it. You know, there was less saturation and everything had more to it. There was less quantity and more quality. And so there's a lot of, you know, very kind of um, rose tinted glasses, retrospective, almost kind of conservative elements to the philosophy of this album from a musical standpoint. But it also, the flip side to that, that, that might make it seem regressive or irrelevant or out of touch, is that what it also does is it gives you something that no other record or no other artist or no one at all really was interested in doing in 2013. And frankly, that's only gotten truer since. This kind of, you know, ridiculously overstuffed, glorious double album with these ambitious structural shifts and every single song doing something different. And that kind of thing is far beyond the pale of what would be, you know, not what would be appropriate, but just what would be popular nowadays. You know, it's so far removed from the kind of cultural moment we're in, in terms of what art is and what albums are. So it had a novelty in 2013 that for me has only gotten more extreme and more made it feel more singular and more kind of alien in its landscape than it did in 2013. That's not even getting into the additional pop culture impact that this record had you know the huge success of get lucky you know the biggest song of 2013 you know sound of the summer as the meme goes sound of the summer <laughs> you know this record has so much and it's such an event in so many different ways that it's kind of hard to fathom and i can only imagine intimidating to approach yes most certainly i mean especially when you consider that this is my first like formal experience with the band and you know it, it feels like even calling them a band on this record is somewhat reductive because of how many people they pull from and even when there's not a prominent feature on a given track you feel the omnipresent lingering influence of whatever it is that they're drawing from on any given moment to the point where you can't really view this album in a vacuum. And that's not a problem because I feel like this album's status as a love letter adds so much charm and so much vitality to the experience that you can really sort of feel the power 
of music when you listen to this album as like cheesy as that sounds it is something that only comes from the byproduct of two artists who are kind of at their creative apex and they're using that as an excuse to be willfully kind of indulgent and i'm always gonna get on board with that to some level just because when there's skillful execution of a big opulent idea that's just something i naturally gravitate towards i have Probably the world's most boring opinion about this album, though, and that I think it's really great. But if you can imagine beforehand what you think my critiques of this album are going to be, you're probably right about all of them. Uh, naturally, it is an album that is huge in scope. Maybe a little too huge in some places. I don't want to harp on that too much just because album length is one of the most boring complaints you can possibly have with something. But it's more, I don't really have a problem with this album in terms of its overall length because, again, I get swept up in the vision so that whenever I had to return to this, that was never really an obstacle. It's really more down to the pacing of certain songs because I think a solid, like, half to maybe even three-fourths of this album is just amazingly paced. I mean, take the opener, for instance. You have, like, this song, you have Give Life Back to Music, which is a great little vertical slice of this album, this experience, in one little song. You have this insatiably slick guitar line, a great hook that they, of course, hammer in over and over again. Uh, you know, and as Daft Punk are ought to do, you know, each kind of measure will bring in a new sonic idea so that just because they don't change the core of whatever a given song idea is, they will add ornate details or subtle touches or flourishes to make it feel new as it repeats. And you get to sort of lose yourself in <laughs> the rhythm of what's happening. Mm -hmm. But also, you can appreciate what is different about it just because you will immediately notice whenever something changes, like uh, the light piano touches on here, or, you know, the sick-ass riff that keeps coming back, the keyboard and synth accent at the apex of the build here. It's all super fun. It, it essentially boils down what this album is meant for. It's just letting in the music and just fucking dancing. It's like a particularly, it's a particular celebration of a particular kind of way of experiencing an album that is much more natural to the period of the LP in its classic era, like the 70s, the 80s. And that experience is like, you put it on, you're overwhelmed, right? You're, you're taking all of this in and not all of it lands, right? Nothing not else in the world exists but this album. That's it. Exactly. And not all of it's going to land and you're not going to remember all of it when you're finished your first listen. But it's one of those things where the, the whole idea is that it is so overloaded, that it is so kind of festering with ideas that each time you come back to it, you'll discover something you missed or forgot about the last time that you listened to it. And it's imperfect by design in the pursuit of achieving some kind of greater holistic expression right this sort of greater holistic celebration yes. of the wide world of music but the really brilliant thing about it is that the way that it so shamelessly is such a ridiculous nostalgic celebration of all these different eras of rock and pop music but how it also retains the core dna of daft punk and what daft punk sound like in every song Right. It's actually quite stunning the way they do this, especially if you look at this record and you take the individual elements of it and you can see a, a beautiful synthesis of homework, of discovery, if even human after all. Certainly, I would say more discovery than those other two, but you can see the core Daft Punk tenets have just melded beautifully into the incorporation of like traditional rock and roll sounds and give life back to music into yacht rock sounds and fragments of time into jazzier spaces and songs like Within for instance into pure Ooh. electronic melodrama like the instrumentals such as motherboard and then the you know furiously intense climax contact which circles their entire career back to their early single releases and the homework sound the whole thing is just incredible and there's certain songs i'll get into but holistically it's just one of those albums that you marvel at and from a moment to moment experience listening to it you may enjoy it more or less depending on your attachment to and your feelings about the nature of the pastiche that they're going for uh, certainly i think that there it's an album that's deliberately structured to have these big moments you know 
very strategically mm-hmm. uh, scattered throughout the track list that just we're the whole album, you know, just completely demands your attention. Like you might be zoning out a little bit during Game of Love and Within and Beyond. I mean, I certainly do. Those aren't my favorite songs on the record, but they're there to give you that breathing space between these big epics. Songs like Giorgio by Marauder, songs like Touch, and songs like That Closer Contact, which are the three kind of pinnacles of the album's ambitious excess i think with the real throw everything at the wall but with purpose as well it's not just let's throw everything at the wall because it's a big celebration i mean i think giorgio by Moroto, which i kind of want to zero in on first as in terms of the mm. big songs is i think like the most i guess central to the whole album's identity basically because it's the most blatant about what it's doing and about how it represents the entire album right from the jump, right from the whole central conceit, this sort of lifetime told through words and music at the same time of Giorgio Moroder. Obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but clearly the biggest influence on Daft Punk in every respect, right? Basically everything that they do in every stage of their career owes back to Giorgio Moroder. Not that he invented the kind of electronic aesthetics and dance music things, or that he was the sole inventor, but he was by far probably the most influential single person on the history of electronic music and its relationship to pop you know and and getting him to tell his life story and then augmenting that life story by actually taking you through the sounds that he's exploring and that he's talking about as his music has evolved as his as he has aged through these different eras is stunning i mean not, not just to look at it as well as like track three on the album nine minutes you don't get this on on typical records right like no. the album you know in some respects i think the album could have opened or closed with this but the decision to put it in at the third track is just so ballsy right like you're the album brings you in it settles you down and then it opens up with this huge expansive track i mean jake what are your thoughts on this one unsurprisingly i love the song i think it's terrific it's one of the first standout moments on the album not to like backpedal or even dwell on this too long but it is just a bizarre sequencing choice to put this right after game of love which honestly like the first time i listened to this i i felt sucker punched by because it it's it's like it's really like sensual and subtle and like soulful and mournful and like it, it's just a very strange downturn and then like immediately after that you have you know this thing that opens up with this long sort of not necessarily spoken words because there is music behind it but you're paying more attention to Marauder than you are the instrumental necessarily just in what he's talking about and then you get that fucking little bubbly cycling synth that really like kicks off once he's done and it lasts like maybe a little bit long for my liking, but that doesn't matter because the huge crescendo at the end is worth any amount of time that it takes to actually get there because, like, it's the most satisfying fucking sound in the entire goddamn universe. The the evolving drum break after that that keeps shifting and the record scratches that duel with the guitar... Like, this is a marvel of amazing aesthetic textural ideas that just fucking go at each other. And it's like, yes, exactly. Every minute of the song introduces an amazing new musical idea as well. It's not just the, 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 this is really about the journey rather than the destination. I mean, you have this gorgeous, like, Rhodes piano solo about four minutes in that's just taken mm. out of a fucking jazz fusion record. Like, sounds like Herbie Hancock's fucking come up on the track. And then you get that gorgeous sort of <laughs> string break about six minutes in where the whole thing kind of comes to a still and then just kind of ushers you into the fucking future like the synthesis of ideas on this track is mind-boggling to me and it also like this track is also a nice moment to comment on the pop cultural footprint of this album which is a really interesting thing because you know it's so backward looking it's so retrospective and yet it has had this weird i'm not saying it's influenced a lot of music i don't know that it has which is interesting to say but it's just that elements of this album and things that represent i suppose how huge this was as well but how intuitively daft punk are able to connect with their audience 
can be seen in the legions of memes this album is inspired like the Giorgio by oh, yeah. meme, where it's like you know my name is Giovanni Giorgio but everybody calls me Giorgio and in the set coming in like the, that, the fact that that itself was a meme like years after the album came out and in the fucking vine era was just so bizarre <laughs> and of course, you have, you know, the, the various memes associated with Get Lucky as well. The biggest song of Daft Punk's entire career, which is not, you know, for lack of other contenders. I mean, you've got, you've had Around the World, you've had One More Time, you've had Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. They've had so many hits. And yet this one mm-hmm. eclipsed all of them. And it's like another moment of just dazzling musical perfection that just kind of completely takes you away i mean it's kind of difficult to divorce it or no not divorce it but it's kind of difficult to approach it in the context of the album because it's just taken on such a life of its own as its own song um but you know you when you listen to it in the album you appreciate how connected it is to everything else but also how well it functions as this show-stopping moment you know one of my favorite i think this album is sequenced pretty immaculately and one of my favorite examples of that is the the end of touch going into get lucky right because touch is this just yeah touch is an emotionally overwhelming song i've, I've seen a lot of people who think this yeah. is Daft punk's best song and it's some people i've seen on the internet who think this is their favorite song of all time i can understand that there's so much infused into touch right this central narr- okay because sorry i'm getting overwhelmed here but i'll try and nail my point down there, like, because the whole thing about Daft Punk's artistic identity, right? The robots learning to be human, you know, the the representation of the machine of electronic music and its intrinsic relationship to humanity, but trying to kind of bridge this seeming divide that people perceive, you know, electronic music is lifeless. Electronic music is, you know, can never have the the gravitas or the portent or the the humanity, you know, of organic instrumentation. That kind of core. the rejection of that idea that's been at the core of Daft Punk's entire artistic personality and that they've explored by actualizing that into an an actual narrative within their albums of we are two robots that are learning to be human, right? And that's something that's carried through all of their albums. And and beating that into the ground in a more reductive way was the thing that made human after all so annoying. But here they, in, in moments like Game of Love, in moments like, uh contact and particularly in a moment like touch which i think is the core moment for this idea you have this actual story actualized through the lens of one of pop's most legendary songwriters paul williams who wrote many of the carpenters biggest songs hugely prolific and hugely influential songwriter star of brian de palma's fan of the paradise also worth mentioning and he's just doing this in the because in the context of daft punk the song is stunning because so many Every Daft Punk song about the robots wanting to be human is that vocoder voice, you know, expounding that desire, that that seeking humanity through dance. But when Paul Williams comes in, you know, at the intro of the song, he's kind of, you know, scattered and disintegrated and, and br- broken up. But then his voice hits this, this gravelly, such a real human voice, right? And there's someone who is isolated from their own humanity. And it's so emotionally impactful. And yeah, the song goes through these sweeping, very prog influenced sections, ends with this g- glorious st- swell of strings in this children's choir, taking it to this huge place. And then all of that falling away just for his voice and silence. And then Get Lucky comes in and it's like, whoa, <laughs> this is this is a journey, man. I mean, what are your thoughts on, I guess, sequencing, but also like this particular juncture in the record as well, where it really starts giving you these heavy hitters. The sequencing is weird in that it simultaneously is something that bugs me and is something that I probably wouldn't change if given the opportunity just because it it, it feels like your ability to get on board with what Daft Punk are doing on this album is really your prerogative because it's not a matter of whether or not they made the right choices. It's just whether or not they, those choices work for you, I guess. And I mean, like, I've tried to, like, worm my way around trying to think of how, like, what, like, things could, like, fundamentally maybe improve this experience. And I come up with genuinely very little. And I mean, no shock here. Touch is just an amazing fucking moment. I mean, everything that you described about it is amazing. The the way that the vocals come in, like, more comparatively unadorned, like, it reminds me of a moment on a record that 
I wouldn't be shocked if this was like, I mean, not again, it's not a direct idea, but like, I'm sure the person who made the album that I'm about to talk about probably listened to this when it came out, but it very much reminds me of the moment on the intro track to Frank Ocean's blonde Nikes, where his pitch shifted vocals occupy most of the song. And then midway through, it just breaks into this beautiful moment where you eventually hear his vocals and they are perfectly unadorned and it is a wonderful little moment and this very much capitalizes on that idea of creating tension with an idea that you don't initially recognize and then gradually revealing it like especially the ending here like it ascends and becomes something more heavily string orchestrated the sample the choir and then it's like getting to the gold at the end of the rainbow and then that gold is fucking get lucky which coldest take in the universe is my favorite song on here because this song is crystallized pop perfection there's nothing wrong with this song if you take this song and you scientifically dissect each and every part of it you cannot find a single flaw it's factual don't come at me with any takes about fucking get lucky i don't even have any overriding notes to say about this the hook is perfect pharrell is perfect the nile rogers guitar is perfect everything is perfect fuck you if you don't think this is perfect what i i mean who doesn't love get lucky i mean come on exactly what I love, my, my favorite detail about get lucky is how subtly it evolves like I, I I would contrast it with um, "Lose Yourself to Dance," which is a song I like and has a lot of similar elements, but also falls short in a lot of ways that "Get Lucky" doesn't, because that's a song like "Doing It Right" as well. And again, I like both of these songs, but they are very much Daft Punk in their let's hone it down to like two or three elements and just yeah. create something hypnotizing out of that experience. Whereas the evolution within a song like "Get Lucky" is so subtle but so perceptually there like the way in which the vocoder vocals take on a greater presence as support for pharrell as the song goes on you know niall rogers guitar playing and the, and the presence of the bass gets a little bit more intricate as it goes on just these tiny little swells where nothing is fundamentally changing and structurally in the song it's doing an a b a b very formulaic thing but by the time you get to the final chorus you feel as though you've crested in a way that you don't with some of those other moments that are a little bit less fully formed i think I definitely agree in respect to there are sort of moments on here that kind of feel like they just sort of live in the shadow of moments that are so titanic and how well put together they are that they it, it's almost just an inevitable result of like the law of averages. Like I think that getting Panda Bear on doing it right is frankly an inspired choice of feature just because it's an idea that is unconventional that you wouldn't expect, but definitely does work. And it feels like, you know, it, at this point of like, I feel like Daft Punk and Animal Collective certainly came up in the same, you know, online cultural ascendancy space. And it feels like them collaborating together while it doesn't really like immediately make sense to you sonically, spiritually, it absolutely does because they both harken back to musical roots that are so deeply ingrained with modern music, like with, you know, sunshine, pop and disco, these things that feel like a billion years in the past, but yeah. are being brought up to being like modern and like the hook on doing it right is fantastic. It's maybe hammered a little bit too much for my liking, but it's still a fantastic hook. I wish I could say the same thing for the other song on here, which is, I, I don't dislike Lose Yourself to Dance because frankly, there are too many great things about it. But man, I really don't like Pharrell on the hook. It's he just he goes up a little too high in his vocal register and it's just like, and I'm like, all right, can we just like maybe an octave to take that down like a little bit because it's it's just a little bit annoying, like just a tiny yeah. little bit. Yeah, and I agree to a certain extent. Like I love, love this album, but it's definitely one of those cases where I love it in spite of some of its weaknesses as opposed to kind of because of them. Although I guess both things are true. Like yeah. Lose Yourself to Dance is one of my least favorite yeah. songs on the record, but I just, I, I still would never like dream of of, of skipping it and or nor would I really get sick of it while I'm listening to it. I'm just kind of like, you know, there's parts of this experience that I'm yeah. enjoying more than, like, like for instance, how, 
Giorgio Bamaroda is kind of sandwiched between Game of Love and Within, which are two of the kind of more withdrawn songs in the record. And I like that sequencing choice mm-hmm. because Giorgio Bamaroda is so over the top and so stuffed with ideas that you need to come down from that. And you also need to have a, yeah. a sort of a, a, a slower paced groundwork established for that to begin on. Um, but, you know, there are other sequencing moments on the record as well, like the positioning of lose yourself to dance in between instant crush and touch that I do, that do kind of fatigue me in some respects. That said, mm-hmm. Instant Crush with Julian Casablancas, I think one of the most enduring songs on Woo! this album, one of the most celebrated, one of the most popular with the kids these days. It is such a great synthesis. I mean, what works about doing it right, just to go back a step, is that you're right. Panda Bear has is Brian Wilson, you know, is a new Brian Wilson vocally. Like that's what he gives, that's what he brings. Yep. And the contrast with the vocoder vocals on that song is the beauty of doing it right. And Instant Crush is kind of an inverse thing, right? It's not about contrast. It's actually about how well Julian fits in as this robotic voice, as this kind of robotic figure, as this representation of Daft Punk's ethos, right? Like I do, I don't want to read too much into this, but I do think there's a kind of sort of overarching narrative of the the robots becoming human as the album goes on. And Instant Crush is yes, kind of this pivotal point where you get that melancholy of that being stuck in that process of learning to be human and discovering how painful emotions can be that this song represents. And Julian just nails it. I mean, everything about the song was perfect. I completely agree. Instant Crush is a very, very close second to in in terms of my favorite things on here. And it honestly, like, I I feel like it does in a sense, like there, when you talked about this album's cultural footprint is that there are certain moments on it that I certainly would say are very predictive of what some elements of music and alternative music would become. Very specifically with Julian Casablancas, because I think it's undeniable that Julian maybe took some notes from this song, which is like, hey, maybe my new projects that I work on should sound a little bit more like this. Because I mean, what is the new abnormal if not entirely consisting of songs that sound exactly like Instant Crush? And to that album's huge benefit in my opinion at least but like the the way he just kind of tunes his falsetto perfectly with everything here it's so fantastic and i agree that this is one of the moments on the album that like there's a there's a real there is a real narrative here that i came to appreciate on multiple listens in that there's a lot of moments on here when they aren't you know paying direct homage to their heroes and musical influences that is quite melancholic that is a lot that is very downbeat there are a lot of moments on here that for a celebration of music come across as very downtrodden like within is like it starts as like a really lovely piano piece that's like really classical it's like i mean it's super jarring how classical it is in contrast to what came before it and then the lyrics though are like really unexpectedly mournful like the second track and it seems to allude to at least as far as i can tell a world that they have inside them that they might refer to as their like artistic drive that they get lost within the vastness of trying to navigate life with uh and they just sort of like it it leads them to becoming more and more lost so it feels as though the act of latching onto so many of their heroes their influences and genres that inspired them is giving the duo direction as the Mm -hmm. song puts it to tell them who they are and then you go right in to instant crush afterwards and like it shows the intricacy of the construction of these songs by still melding the old with the new and like then after that you have like it just the way that it builds these ideas of setting up a narrative question that the the duo are facing a dilemma and then subsequently answering it musically with what immediately comes afterwards is an, is an idea that they revisit multiple times on this album and that's what makes the structure work like it mm. is a mess there is like there are just parts of it that don't work for me but this one simple sort of tether that they stick to is what makes this album work as a whole in my Mm. opinion anyway and it's one of the fundamental reasons why this is an album album you know what i mean it's an it's a thing with an identity where the songs are expressing a, a a narrative within that that represents that identity and on a meta level with a song like within you get 
you know, because this is so retrospective, because it is so, you know, of its influences that you have to have a moment like that where you're, it's kind of like you're swamped within that trying to find your own identity. And there's a, there is a kind of lower lying narrative, I suppose, of Daft Punk kind of through this journey, both coming, going, both discovering who they are through their influences, but also maybe in the process, almost contradictorily losing sight of what makes them unique. And it doesn't surprise me in that sense that they haven't made an album since this, because there is, it's not always super obvious, but I think there is throughout this, there's this sense of them being wrecked by this contradiction, by this paradox of not being able to clearly define themselves outside of the things that influence them once they've kind of receded into their, you know, twilight era beyond their era of, of ultimate influence. So that is very poignant in songs like Within. And, you know, Instant Crush is funny as well, because again, another thing you need to, you only appreciate if you had the context at the time is that this song and the album came out about two months after the Strokes dropped Come Down Machine, which I think personally mm. is an underrated album, but was like within the context of the discography was like kind of the nail in the coffin for like, this is a band that has no new ideas. You know, this is the band that are just kind of like mm -hmm. writing their template out. And that album got fucking eviscerated critically. And again, I think it's better than its reputation suggests. I really like that album, but it was this kind of thing where it was like, and when this song came out with Julian doing this very revitalized thing, it totally did kind of highlight that disparity. And, and I think the, that, that influence can be seen most clearly in the EP that the Strokes did. Um, the uh, Future Present Past EP in 2016, where you do get, on a song like uh, Oblivious, where Julian is very clearly essentially replicating Instant Crush. Uh, so that's a really interesting little thing. But yeah, this idea of the trappings of nostalgia as well is crystallized beautifully on one of my absolute favorite Daft Punk songs, which is Fragments of Time. I adore this. And I mean, it's a deep cut. A lot of people kind of overlook it or forget about it. But it is, to me, this is a perfect song. It certainly is one of the tracks on the record that owes the most song. to jazz rock and yacht rock specifically steely dan who have been compared who this has been compared to in the past i don't want to labor that too much especially because it's kind of obvious of me to do that but man this is so crystallized this is perfect this is musically sumptuous it's more complex than it initially seems on the surface there's a lot going on rhythmically but there's just beautiful elements to the way that all the melodies are composed and all the things are performed guest vocalist todd edwards another living legend giving this huge sense of personality into the song and it's beautiful it has these sunshiny chords it has this glorious very daft punk talk box vocaloid solo it has so much that just lifts your spirits when you listen to it and then you read the lyrics and you appreciate that oh this is actually a really melancholic song about being completely disconnected from your identity and your sense of purpose and having only your memories essentially and having only these fragments of time that you're trying to assemble into something that gives you a reason to exist and on some level you have to feel like daft punk are doing that they're they're reckoning with that question and they don't really have an answer and that's okay because the question itself is what's interesting. And I so I, I think it's such a pivotal moment on the record. And I mean, look, there's other songs that I, we don't need, really have time to get into that, uh, that I like that are, but are more disconnected from my general thesis. Like Motherboard, for instance, which is a beautiful instrumental, has this surprising sense it's, of progression. This is the most it. underrated song on this album. It is a <laughs> masterpiece. I adore Motherboard. It's gorgeous, right? I mean, this, I, I would say this like general third quarter of the album from beyond through to doing it right or beyond through fragments of time specifically that three track run, I think is a really underrated stretch of very beautiful music. Oh yeah. And yeah. So to me, fragments of time is, is what's the climax thematically, but the climax musically, I mean, what it all leads to is absolutely contact, which is just oh, yeah. like an absolutely stunning piece of music. These massive, you know, gurgling, burbling synthesizers that brush up against this insane, like organic drum beat and this sense of like constant ascension that's happening throughout the song to the point where you, the synthesizer lead starts getting more and more distorted and scratchy as the song goes on. A deliberate callback to the scratchy synth sound that's all over homework to the point where I get really emotional listening to this. It sounds like something that is burning up as it just flies higher and higher and higher, like in a final escape from the trappings of 
you know the the synthesized world i guess from the perspective of daft punk we need to escape this we need to just completely be able to ascend beyond it and the whole thing ends in this fiery explosion and it's genuinely like hard as hell and kind of emotional I think there's really something to the way that the arc of the album comes to a close here, because like beneath the pop perfection of Get Lucky is a lyric in there that I think is kind of key to understanding where the duo are at at this point in their career. It's that we've come too far to give up who we are. And I feel like this is an album that is about, you know, it's about getting lost within your interests, getting lost within this world of endless creative possibilities and then finding singularity and finding it through your heroes and latching on to them. But at the same time, acknowledging the trappings of trying to replicate your heroes mindlessly being a, a kind of futile effort. And that's what the downbeat moments on here are. They are acknowledging the darkness inherent of what Daft Punk do and that's why when you know you have these moments that bounce back from it like get lucky or uh uh that, that go off into stuff like motherboard for instance which is just like a pure cathartic song or fragments of time for instance which kind of takes the energy back down a little bit and then doing it right is actually a great counterpoint to fragments of time because you know it's like what's the hook on this song doing it right everybody will be dancing and we'll be doing it right it's they find purpose and they shove the darkness aside and then contact is them ascending and then just you know finding their purpose then getting past it and you're right they are trying to leave behind the synthetic world but the beautiful microcosm of this song is that what do they have to do to ascend? They have to use the synthetic. They have to use technology in order to escape in the first place. And it's a beautiful little metaphor for this point of the just not only the album, but them, their career, all of it just sort of synthesizes perfectly into this one thing where this album certainly, you know, we've talked about how it has less essential moments, weird structure, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, is that what makes this album so special and so revered is that it can only be a Daft Punk album. And through the lens of being a Daft Punk album, it achieves so much more than what other electronic music acts and albums can accomplish with the context of their artistry, which is essential into looking at music, especially with the way that we do and the way that we review things. I feel like that a lot of people maybe don't view music in the same holistic way that we often do. They kind of detach themselves a little bit. And this right here is one of the key essential reasons why I think this perspective, this holistic album and holistic career perspective is so important to look at things from. Because if you ignore this, you miss so many things about what make this album so special. Mm, absolutely one last detail I'll, I'll end on is just going back to 2013 because again that's sort of the whole purpose of these particular record clubs where we're looking back on 10th anniversaries you know when i think about the context of this for me i uh, i had just turned 16 and was already being saturated by you know so much great music that had already come out in this year and one detail i want to end on is that uh how i i, I bought this album digitally on itunes when it came out um i might probably pre-ordered it but i know i don't think i pre-ordered it i think i bought it the day it came out and i bought it with an itunes gift card that i got for my 16th birthday and i used that itunes gift card to buy two albums this one and boards of canada's tomorrow's harvest which came out about a month later Ooh. and this these were just both examples of these acts who had returned from the dead who had in my childhood completely defined in a huge way how I learned to love music, who had just kind of come back from the ether to make these, in both cases, surprisingly gloomy, but also really revitalized statements, pondering the nature of their existence. Now, I'm projecting a little bit with Boards of Canada. There's not a lot to read into with that album. I mean, it is a very apocalyptic and dark and heavy album emotionally. But in the both cases, it was like these bands who had come back from the dead and the overarching broad thing was how do we reckon with like why do we exist still like we are so beyond you know the moment that we occupied why do we exist still looking inward and seeing this dark 
question that you have to confront and the answers aren't always pretty and you don't always have an answer and you kind of respond by embracing the darkness that comes with growing into this later stage and it's you know it's interesting that both acts haven't released an album since these particular records which came out so close together they feel like endings in ways that are sad i mean particularly in the case of the boys of canada album it's very morose but that also feel like they come with this feeling of acceptance, right? That everything has led to the moment that we're at and that we can let go of the the desire, the need to, you know, make music, to, to kind of continually pursue and be a part of the process and that we can just bow out on these statements essentially. Now, I don't know if Boards of Canada will ever release another album. Maybe they will. I'm even less... I, I have less faith that Daft Punk will, especially considering they have officially broken up. But nothing's outside the realm of possibility. You know, I think if they both if both of these acts ever do release another album, it will add a really interesting wrinkle to the narrative of Random Access Memories and Tomorrow's Harvest, respectively. But as it is, you know, 2013, as much as that was a year of innovation in a lot of different respects, it was also a year of endings. And None of them were more ceremonious. None of them were more extravagant. None of them were more ostentatious. And none of them were more memorable than Random Access Memories. And that's why it is one of the albums of 2013 and one of the albums of the decade. They they came back like the legend of the Phoenix. Favorite tracks and ratings for this album. Jake, you go first. Instant Crush. We've got Get Lucky. And we've got Motherboard. Least favorite lose yourself to dance uh seven out of ten i highly enjoyed this album and i, I i'm going to get to uh, homework and discovery and all, all that jazz eventually uh my my newfound appreciation for house and dance music i'm sure will inform my takes onto those so stay tuned because i'm sure i'll have something to say about, about them in the future my three favorite tricks are uh fragments of time Giorgio by Maroder and Touch. Least favorite track. I don't know. Uh, I, maybe Game of Love. I really don't have one. Uh, the album gets an eight from me. Let us know what you think of Daft Punk's Random Access Memories in the comments below. What does this album mean to you? Have you been a fan of it since release? Is it something that you have a complicated relationship, not as into it? Let us know whatever of you fall on this album in the comments below. Let us know your takes, especially if you disagree with us, but also let us know if we hit it on the money as well. Either way, want to hear from you. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel as well. Both those things help us out a lot. If you want to go above and beyond and support us directly for just $1 a month, you can hit the join button, become a member of the Jams Tea family, get your name and the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to talk about, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Energizer. It just keeps going and going and going. Ooh!